of the oral presentations. Um, we have uh, five presentations this evening. Each speaker will have eight minutes uh, to present their uh, abstract and then two minutes of question. Uh, please uh, send in your questions. Our first uh, speaker, uh, speaker is Dr. Benoit uh, Malare, who will speak to us about new receptor for reticulocyte invasion of uh, Plasmodium vivax. Uh, Benoit, stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I would like to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to present my work on uh, Plasmodium vivax and a, a new receptor. So today I will focus only on the uh, blood stage of Plasmodium vivax. You have currently eight different species can infect human, but only the four last ones on these slides are zoonotic uh, malaria. And so the two uh, main ones are Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. The main difference between these two species is Plasmodium falciparum can infect normocytes when Plasmodium vivax can infect reticulocytes. So I will explain to you what the difference between these two populations of uh, red blood cells. So during the development of the red blood cells in the bone marrow, you end up at the end of the erythropoiesis with the enucleation of the erythroblast and formation, on, uh, and formation of uh, reticulocytes that can be infected by uh, Plasmodium vivax. And this population of red blood cells are CD71 positive or transferrin receptor positive. When you look at the current uh, map of uh, malaria in the world, you can see between Plasmodium falciparum the main, and Plasmodium vivax, the main difference is Plasmodium... I don't see, you can see my cursor, sorry. Yeah, better. You can see the main difference is that we cannot find Plasmodium vivax in the west part of Africa. This one is linked by the absence of the Duffy uh, receptor in this part of uh, Africa. It's known since uh, 1970, uh, 1978 that uh, people that are Duffy negative in the west part of Africa are resistant to uh, Plasmodium vivax infection. The only issue with this uh, receptor is present on normocyte and reticulocyte, so cannot explain the reticulocyte cell tropism of uh, Plasmodium uh, vivax. More recently, in uh, 2010, a team from Pasteur Institute in Madagascar identified that Plasmodium uh, Vivax can infect also Duffy negative uh, patients. So making the picture of Plasmodium Vivax infection a bit more complicated. And uh, more and more recent studies are showing that there are more and more cases of Plasmodium Vivax in west part, of Af uh, west part and east part of Africa in this negative, uh, uh, Duffy negative patients. And more recently, with a, a collaborator from Namibia, we identified that also in Namibia, Duffy negative patient can be infected by Plasmodium vivax. So this one uh, opens the fact that we should identify specific receptor at the surface of retic uh, the reticulocyte for Plasmodium vivax. In uh, our study in uh, 2015, we are able to identify that vivax in the peripheral blood using, uh, using cord blood invade preferentially uh, CD71 uh, uh, positive population of retics, and that maybe could happen also in, in the bone marrow. We are quite happy to see uh, that uh, our colleague from, uh, from Australia, from WEI, a project uh, led by uh, Wei Hong Tain, and uh, in collaboration with us, identify that transferrin receptor, the CD71 uh, molecule, is a receptor for plasmodium virus. So that was the first study showing a specific reticulocyte receptor. So we are looking for other receptors at the surface of the reticulocyte that could be involved in the invasion of plasmodium virus. So the study in science was showing that CD71 can link to uh, reticulocyte binding protein 2B. So we tried to identify other receptors and other ligands can be involved in this invasion. So you can see on this uh, figure, by mass spectrometry, we are able to screen different receptors present at the surface of the CD71 positive reticulocyte in green, or at the surface of the normal site. And you can see we get one hit CD98 uh, protein, and this protein is trypsin resistant. And what is important, because uh, Plasmodium vivax invasion is sensitive to uh, trypsin treatment. We move forward the characterization of the CD98 expression of the surface of the reticulocyte, and you can see when, uh, uh, by flow cytometry, when you focus on tiazole orange positive cells, so tiazole orange is a marker for RNA, so when you focus on majority of immature reticulocytes, 
all of these cells, majority of these cells, are CD71 positive and CD98 positive, making CD98 as a good candidate as a reticulocyte uh, receptor. We characterize also the expression of CD98 by uh, immunofluorescence. So it was present, is it present on the retics and uh, not present on normal site. Same thing by Westerblom. We are showing the expression of CD98 on the immature reticulocyte and a decreased uh, expression uh, during the maturation. So this one is just to show you that uh, CD98 is a quite uh, complex molecule. So you have the extracellular part, the heavy chain, and you have the intracellular part, the light chain. So we use antibodies can target uh, the extracellular part of, the, uh, uh, of this protein to, uh, to try to block the invasion of plasmodium vivax. So on this graph, you can see when you use a monoclonal antibody or polyclonal antibody against uh, CD98, we block very well the invasion of plasmodium vivax. We use antibody against Duffy or DARK as a positive control for our inhibition. And if you can see also on this graph, when you are using antibodies against Bacigene or CD147, a well-known uh, uh, receptor for plasmodium falciparum, we don't affect the invasion of plasmodium virax. We move forward to try to identify the ligand of CD98, and you have a system that we can express at the surface of HK cells, the different uh, 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 molecule uh, from uh, plasmodium virax. And you can see on this graph, when we stain the reticulocyte in green, or the normal side in green, we are able to do a rosetting assay to identify which molecule and which ligand could be involved in this interaction. And this one, because I don't have so much time, I show you just the heat what we, we get with RBP2A. And on this graph, we can see also with Duffy binding protein, the level of interaction between reticulocyte and our system. So we have very, very nice binding uh, when we use RBP2A with the reticulocyte. When we are using antibodies again RBP2A, we can see that we block the resetting. So now the idea is to see the clear interaction between CD19 and RBP2A. By immunoprecipitation, you can see on this graph, we are able to see a clear interaction between CD19 and RBP2A. When we are using uh, ELISA technique and doing a coating uh, of the plate with RBP2A, you can see also a nice binding between uh, RBP2A and CD98. And when you, you, you are using CD71, you don't have any binding. To make it, make it, make it this interaction very clear, we use a bio-layer uh, interferometry technique. And you can see with different concentration of uh, RBV2A, we have a ni very nice binding with a very, very good KD between uh, uh, RBP2A and CD98. So in terms of key findings for this study, we are able to show that CD98, that it's a trypsin-resistant protein, is uh, specifically expressed at the surface of CD90, CD71 reticulocytes. CD98 is essential for uh, plasmodium vivax invasion. RBP2A is important for this plasmodium vivax invasion. RBP2A interacts with CD98. And so the final finding is the potential uh, for RBP2A as a vaccine candidate uh, against uh, vac vac uh, malaria. And so I would like to thank all the people involved in this work, and particularly the team of uh, Laurent Regna and uh, Bruce Russell for this work. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. We don't have any questions just yet, but I'll, I'll jump in. And that was uh, Impressive amount of material presented in a very short period of time. I appreciate your efficiency. I, I thought I understood you to say that uh, uh, P. vivax invasion was a trypsin sensitive uh, process, yet you chose a trypsin resistant uh, molecule you were looking for. That was one of your criteria. I'm not sure I, I comprehend. Okay, so when you treat a uh, reticulocyte with trypsin, you block the invasion. Yeah. So you need to have a protein that is trypsin resistant. Ah. So we are eliminating all of the trypsin sensitive ah, okay. proteins as a, as a screen. So what role do you think that uh, this molecule plays in, in, other than docking and invasion, what, how is it working in collaboration with the other mechanisms? Uh, so we know that, for example, CD98 is important for the amino acid tra transportation. Mm. So it's around very tricky to do a silencing of this protein to, to characterize the invasion. Mm. No further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for an excellent you. presentation. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, now let's welcome um, the second presenter. Uh, she is Ms. Po Xianying. And she'll be telling us about the role of MMPs and NETs. I'll let her explain what those things are. 
um, in, mura, in human and murine central nervous system tuberculosis, looking at targets for host directed therapy to improve immunopathology. Uh, Shenning, please, when you're ready. Hi, good evening everyone. Today I will, I will be presenting to you my study which investigates the role of host inflammatory response in CNSDB, focusing on matrix metalloproteinases and neutrophil extracellular tracts. First of all, a brief introduction on CNSTB and its associated immunopathologies. CNSTB, caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, is the most devastating form of TB with high morbidity and mortality. Even with treatment, about 50% of patients die or suffer from long-term neurological sequela such as cranial nerve palsies and vision loss. Here are two CT scans showing the clinical manifestations characteristic of CNSTB, including tuberculoma and hydrocephalus. Immunopathology in CNSTB is characterized by extensive brain inflammation and tissue destruction, as shown here in this H&E stained TBM brain specimen, featuring caseous necrosis, with many leukocyte infiltration forming the granuloma. This immunopathology is driven by a matrix degrading phenotype, which results from an increased level of matrix metalloproteinases relative to their tissue-specific inhibitors or TIMS in short. The breakdown of the blood-brain barrier in particular is driven by the gelatinases MMP2 and 9. Next are extracellular DNA strewn from the nuclei of neutrophils to kill bacteria and are featured here in this colored scanning electron micrograph as yellow web blood structures. Studies have shown that nets are produced when neutrophils encounter MTB and that nets are associated with MMP such as 8 and 9. In, act in active pulmonary TB patients, nets are associated with tissue damage and correlate with disease severity. However, the importance of nets in CNS-TB remain unknown. Thus, my hypothesis is that MMPs and nets drive CNS-TB immunopathology, and the aims of my study is to first investigate the expression of MMPs and nets in CNS-TB patients and a, and a murine CNS-TB model, followed by evaluating the association of MMPs and nets with disease severity in CNS-TB. Last but not least, the role of MMPs and NETS in CNSTB immunopathology and their role in and the potential for host directed therapy will be investigated. First, let me bring you through the workflow of my clinical study. Pediatric patients from Sabah, Malaysia are grouped into two groups, TBM and non-TBM. Their, their CSF samples are analyzed for the expression of MMPs, teams, and NETS. Within the TBM, the CT or MRI brain scans are also analyzed for radiological abnormalities such as contrast enhancement and ventricular dilatation. MPRIN, which is an activator of MMPs and gelatinases MMP2 and 9, was significantly higher in TBM patients compared to non-TBM. But using a fluorometric functional assay, I found the gelatinase activity to correlate positively with CSF MMP2 and 9 concentrations. To further confirm that the gelatinase activity measured is due to MMP2 and 9, an, inhib an inhibition assay using neutralizing MMP2 or 9 antibodies were performed, which significantly reduced the gelatinase activity, thus confirming that MMP2 and 9 contributes to gelatinase activity in the CSF. On the other hand, TIMS 2 and 4, which are endogenous MMP inhibitors, were significantly lower in TBM patients. With, hi with higher MMPs and lower TIMS, this demonstrates the presence of a matrix degrading phenotype in TBM patients. CSF nets, as measured by extracellular DNA and citrullinated H3 concentration, were found to be significantly higher in TBM compared to non-TBM patients. And as I mentioned earlier, nets are associated with MMPs such as MMP9, and I found a significant uh, significant positive correlation between citrine H3 and MMP9 concentrations. Of note, TBM patients form a cluster with high NETS and MMP9 concentrations as compared to non-TBM patients. Having profiled CSF NETS, I next investigated if NETS are associated with disease severity in CNS-TB. Interestingly, TBM patients with rectal meningeal enhancement, ventricular dilatation, or who have a poor clinical outcome have higher CSF NETS than patients without or who have a good clinical outcome. This suggests that NETS may be associated with disease severity in CNS-TB. In summary, TBM patients have higher CSF NETS, amprin, and gelatinases MMP2 and 9, but decreased TIMS 2 and 4, which demonstrates the presence of a matrix-degrading phenotype in CNS-TB. 
Moreover, TBM patients with leptal meningeal enhancement, ventricular dilatation or poor clinical outcome have higher NETS, suggesting that NETS may worsen prognosis in CNS-TB. Next, to create the Murine CNS-TB model, I infected nostril knockout mice with H37RV into the third ventricle. These mice develop brain pathology similar to that seen in humans, including tissue necrosis, granuloma formation, and perivascular cuffing. More, more importantly, these mice also show blood, blood vessel formation around the granulomas, which are similar to that seen in humans. Similar to the finding in my clinical study, brain concentrations of MMP2, 9, and NETS were significantly increased in infected mice, which is further confirmed by immunohistochemical staining, which demonstrates a, a high expression of neutrophils, MMP9, and NETS in the necrotic region of granulomas. Next, to investigate the role of gelatinases MMP2 and 9 in, in CNS-TB immunopathology, I conducted a drug trial and, and treated the infected mice with SB3CT, which is a specific MMP2 and 9 inhibitor. Here you can see that combination therapy with anti-TB and SB3CT significantly reduced MMP9 concentration, gelatinase activity, and increased the survival of infected mice, whereas mice treated with anti-TB alone did not. In an ongoing drug study, I included doxycycline, which is a broad-spectrum MMP inhibitor, and the data to date shows that the combination therapy with doxycycline or SB3CT have significantly increased survival compared to anti-TB treated mice alone. This suggests that MMP inhibition, in particular gelatinases, may improve survival in CNS-TB. To summarize my talk, I have shown MMP2, 9, and NETS to be significantly upregulated both in humans and my murine CNS-TB model. Co-localization of MMP9, NETS, and neutrophils in the necrotic region of CNS-TB granulomas suggests that neutrophils and its associated mediators may drive tissue destruction in CNS-TB. Last but not least, MMP2 and 9 inhibition improve the survival of, survival of infected mice and, may, and are useful as preliminary data for future host therapy for human CNS-TB. With that, I would like to end my talk. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Henning. Um, I've got a question. Um, just wondering in a model, in your mouse model, did you use steroids as well? Um, no, we don't. Yeah, yeah it's just anti-TB. Um, and and the um, MMP inhibitor? Yeah. yeah. So, so do you see the role of the MMP inhibitor replacing the role of steroids moving ahead in clinical practice? What are your thoughts on yeah, this? Yeah, this is what I hope. So because corticosteroids is a it's an immunosuppression drug, so if MMP inhibition is more targeted and it, it can uh, do the same of increasing the survival of the CNSDB patients, then it would be more ideal compared to a uh, broad immunosuppress immunosuppressive drug. Right. Yeah. Um, and any particular reason why you chose um, an NMP inhibitor as opposed to an NET inhibitor? N NET? Oh, NETS inhibitor. Yes. Uh, that one was part, it was part of the plan, but because it was a, done as a pilot study, so we, we did it as a small small scale study. So we focused on the, on the MMPs first before we look into NETS. Yeah. yeah. Um, any, uh, one more question. There is a question from the audience. In CNS-TB, um, predominant white blood cells are lymphocytes. Any comments on this incongruence with the upregulation of high NETs or MMP9? Um, when, when there is a central nervous system tuberculosis um, um, of the white cells that are isolated from the CSF fluid, they're mainly lymphocytes. So, um, any comments on this incongruence with the upregulation of high NETs or MMP? The MMP9 is main, mainly secreted by neutrophils, but there are other MMPs that play a role in cns -TB as well, and that might explain uh, the importance of other uh, white blood cells like lymphocytes in cns -TB. Yeah, but for, for the sake of this study, we only focus on the neutrophil-related MMPs like MMP9 and NETS. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. No further questions from me. Just one, from what, one question. What, uh, what next steps do you have? Where, where are you going to go with this next? Because there's several steps between here and actually employing it in patients. Mm -hmm. I think first of all, we have to make sure that the the study, the drug study in the mice show a significant survival benefit and there is no adverse effect. Yeah, so for now, it seems that there is a, a improved survival, but then uh, in terms of like the MMP levels and the, in, in, uh, the intended effect that we want to see, we need uh, further validation for the, for the study. Very good. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, presenter, will be Dr. Ling Claytor, uh, Claytor excuse me, who will be speaking to us about uh, a botulism antitoxin, a heptavalent uh, botulism antitoxin, uh, and it's uh, a 15-year uh, systemic safety review. Uh, Dr. Ling? Good evening. I thank you, Chairman. <laughs> good, evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present our study, uh, which is botulism antitoxin using clinical study subjects and patients in a 15 years systematic safety review. Um, I would like to go through with you for the whole overview of the presentation includes the introduction of botulism and the botulism antitoxin, the study objective, methodology, result, and the conclusion. So first is, what is that botulism? You may heard of um, Botox, which is a lot of lady use, and Botox is type A botulism. So botulism itself is a rare life threatening paralytic illness caused by neurotoxin produced by C. botulinum. And I call an example to you. One gram can kill one million population. So the first time I know this number, I almost have a goosebumps all over. And because this, this is a very serious bio weapon, which is classed as a class A agents for bioweapon. But however, it is very um, often on and off globally, we see this kind of botulism outbreak. In Asia Pacific, we have been seeing cases like this uh, in Vietnam, in Thailand. In the last three years, we have seen three episodes in Vietnam, and mainly is the food contaminations uh, for the food industry. And then in Vietnam, last episode happened in March this year. And so therefore, a botulism, it's a disease that we have a very high alert for two domain, the outbreak as well as the bio flats. So BAT, uh, as an abbreviation, it means botulism antitoxin, is an equine derived hypervalent antitoxin used for the treatment of uh, botulism from pediatric to adult. So Singapore's the last uh, case was infant botulism contamination three years ago. And so infant, we also can use BAT. And BAT itself is a mix of hemoglobin for seven serotypes. So full coverage A, B, C, D, E, F, G serotypes. And botulism in cell is the antitoxin, the effectiveness and the safety profile have been that well demonstrated by our clinical trial, as well as the health authorities. So it has approved by US FDA in Singapore, uh, HSA. And the product itself, in principle, as it's a uh, equine product. So in principle, it could be at risk of uh, immunohypersensitive reaction. So because of that, we are really keen to find out what is the safety profile of BAT. Um, so that we did a 15 years systemic safety review to get a full picture for BAT as a safety profile itself. So these are the three questions help us to guide 
the uh, adverse event journey. So first we want to find out what is the related adverse event seen with bats, what is the hypersensitivity reaction to bats, and the last one, what is the related adverse event special interest to bat. Um, we, threw, we dig into the data for the 15 years. So you know 15 years is a long journey. And 15 years ago, there's no um, electronic file. So paper can lost, can um, destroy, can miss. But however, this product is not widely used globally. It's a very niche product. So we are able to collect all the cases has been requested from us and make it as a pre-marketing, post-marketing data set. So the pre-marketing data set you can see here is two uh, phase one clinical study and one um, early assess program by CDC. And the post-marketing data is FDA registered data as well as the post-marketing safety surveillance. It's ongoing, we still are collecting the data. The last 15 years uh, from 2006 to this year, March. So we collect all the data to put it in a very big master data set. So in this master da uh, data set, uh, we collect it from the incidence of the, the adverse event and to the hypersensitivity incidence and to the adverse event special interest. So here is the master data set we has been collect. Um, from this master data set, we use uh, 512 uh, individual subjects that we uh, believe it has a bad um, individual contact with bad with a very uh, conservative number. The 1128 subject is the estimation explored to bad uh, subjects. So here is our founding. 294 patients among 515 subjects are for those who have the complete data set and which is available had the final diagnosis of botulism. So the average, uh, average of age group for this uh, subject 512 subject 44 years old. Um, so the next one is we has been find out the adverse event report is 15.2 total patient explored to bad and 16% of patients with a final diagnosis of to bad. The first four adverse event is fever, tachycardia, uh, bradycardia, and blood pressure increase. So we only have um, 11 cases has a severe adverse event and which is come to 2.2% of total patient explored to bad, which is for severe adverse event for uh, animal biological product like this is rather low. And only have 11 case, 13 events um, explore have the severe adverse event. So this is the uh, last finding, which is if we use a very conservative number, which is confirm bad explored subjects, which is 512, and the bad explored individual experience hypersensitivity is 2.3%. If you use a uh, denominator as 1128, which is estimated uh, explore to bad subjects, which is 5.1% of hypersensitivity. The anaphylaxis occurred is 0.62 to 1.4% of bad explored to the individuals. So as a conclusion, bad anti-botulism, anti-toxin has an acceptable safety profile for patients in a very well-controlled clinical study and in a patient with known or suspected botulism. Um, anaphylaxis rates really low for 0.6% to 1.4%. And the major uh, frequent adverse event report could be fever, tachycardia, bradycardia, and blood pressure increased. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. All right.
I have a question for you, Dr. Clater. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, how do these, uh, how does the safety data uh, compare to other equine uh, derived uh, uh, antitoxins such as diphtheria and tetanus? Very good question. We have been asked all over for different uh, uh, editors. So far, this is the first long term safety profile review being published. So the other for the short term is similar or even higher. Mm. Higher as means double, like approximately 10 to 15 percent. Okay. And so overall, this is a very good safety profile for equine products. Mm -hmm. And this database, if I understand it correctly, I mean, already there's approval from FDA and HSA, for example. Uh, so this is just an expansion or a more comprehensive database than uh, previously uh, accumulated? It's more in a long-term safety follow-up mm. because the study itself has been, uh, the clinical trial data set has been approved for various, um, like FDV counterpart for the country, we approve in Canada, in Europe, in US, of course, and as well as in Singapore. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think yeah. in the interest of time, we have to move on to the next presentation. Right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. The next speaker, I believe, um, is online. It's Dr. Wang Jiren from China. She's from the Peking University People's Hospital. And her research is mainly on antibiotic resistance and resistance mechanisms of Acinetobacter baumanni. So she'll be sharing with us her project on the co-occurrence of the BLA Oxa-23 on plasmid and chromosome in carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter baumanni. Um, and that this does not enhance carbapenem resistance, but increases the fitness. So, uh, Dr. Wang, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining my presentation. My name is Jiren Wang, and I'm a postgraduate student in Peking University People's Hospital. My presentation focuses on multiple copies of BLA-OX23 coexisted in the chromosome and plasmid in carbapenia resistant Acinetobacter baumani that does not enhance carbapenia resistance but increase fitness. Acinetobacter baumani is one of the most common gram-negative obtained with newest pathogens, which could cause various hospital and community-acquired infections. It owes properties as the natural resistance to numerous commonly used antibiotics and the ease to acquire new resistance determinants. Therefore, the emergence of resistance is rising, which always lead to hard to treat infections with worse outcome. ABA has been acknowledged as a global public health threat. Due to the rapid development of antibiotic resistance, there are increasing reports of multi-drug resistance and extensively drug resistance ABA worldwide. Here shows the data of carbapenia resistance ABA from China Antimicrobial Surveillance Network and as you can see, the incidence of CRAP is relatively high since 2015, and it also reaches around 70% this year, leading to increasing infections of CRAP. The carbapenia resistance mechanisms of ABA mainly include the enhancement of beta-lactamase degradation, outer membrane porins changes for decreased permeability, ex expulsion of antibiotics out of cells through efflux bomb. The most significant mechanism of CRAB is the enzymatic degradation of OXA type carbapenia hydrolyzing class D beta lactamase. Among them, OXA23 is one of the most important hydrolyzed. So, BLA OX23 is the most common determinant of CRAB. To date, four transposons, TN2006 to 2009, have been found to mediate the transfer of BLA. OXA23 in CRAB. Researchers have also found that horizontal gene transfer plays an important role in the dissemination of BLA OXA23 genes. Gene amplification is the method most commonly used by bacteria to increase the expression of resistant genes. However, previous studies have shown that BLA OX23 multiplication does not enhance carbapenia resistance in clinical CRAB. At present, there are many reports about OXA23 gene identified on chromosomes or plasmids, but the influence of coexisted BLA OXA23 gene in the chromosome and plasmid to the susceptibility of carbapenems is unknown. 
So we want to explore the coexistence of PLA OXA23 on both the chromosome and plasmid in CRAB, and the, the degree to which multiplication enhances carbapenia resistance and persistence. We have selected isolates from 135 incidentobacter baumini isolates collected from 10 cities in China from 1999 to 2018, from which 11 strains of OXA23 co-localized CRAB were screened, and 18 isolates with BLA OXA23 lo located on the chromosome or plasmid were also selected as controls. We tested 14 antibiotic agents through agar dilution method except for colistin, docicycline, and tigocycline, which were determined by microbose solution. Genome DNA was sequenced using the PacBio RS2 sequencer, de novo ensembled and sequenced by SMRT. We also conducted phenotypic experiments like growth curves, assay, and in vitro competition assay to evaluate the fitness change. Statistical analysis were performed using GraphPad with the p-value lower than 0.05 were considered significant. We found a total of 11 BLA OX23 co harboring CRAB from 135 ADA. The table on the right briefly introduced the basic information of the isolates. From the histogram below, we can see that the pos positive rate of OX23 co localization ha had increased from 0 in 2013 to 24% in 2018. The clonal relevance of these 11 isolates were determined by MIST, and they were all divided into SD2, an international epidemic cloning complex to using the Pasteur scan. These isolates were resistant to most antibiotics, but are still sensitive to colistin. The table below shows the MIC 50 and 90 of the antibiotics. In order to further clarify the correlation between OXA23 colocalization and resistance, we also compared the susceptibility of coexistence and single locate strains. The results show that the MIC15 and 90 of menocycline in co coexisted isolates was twice as high as those in single locate one. Moreover, the MIC50 and 90 of XXT in coexisted isolates were four times and two times lower, respectively, than those in single located isolates. However, no significant differences were observed in most antibiotics. Whole genome sequencing revealed 18 known resistant genes on chromosome, which are consistent with the resistant profile observed. At the same time, we also found that except for OXA23, all plasmids did not contain other resistant genes. In order to analyze the origin of the coexistence, we investigate the transposon type of BLAOX23. The results in the table below show that most of the strains had the same BLAOX23 carrying TN types, regardless of its location. 2014 TJAB1 was the only isolate with OXA23 carried on different TN types. The chromosome and plasmid copies were carried on TN2006 and TN2009, respectively. The evolutionary relationship between OXA23 harboring plasmids was generated through phylogenetic analysis. We found that 11 plasmids were categorized into two clades. Through statistical analysis, we found that there was no distinction between coexisted and single located isolates in growth while well, they grew faster while co incubating with single located ones. The biofilm production and the survival rates immensely varied. Previous research has found that multiplication of BLA OXA23 does not enhance carbapenia resistance. Our results show that BLA OXA23 coexist strains are more resistant to theorem and biofilm formation suggesting that multi-copies and multi-location may enhance the fitness of strains. The different transposon types of the chromosome and plasmid of 2014 TJAB1 revealed that the origin of OXA23 from chromosome and plasmid might not be the same. In previous study, OXA23 multiplication in proteas and E. coli genomes would increase the risk of transmission of enterobacteria CA. We speculate that the occurrence of multiple copies of OXA23 on chromosome and plasmid may increase bacterial fitness in the host and environment, leading to severe condition in patients and increase the risk of the emergence and spread of CRAB. 
This work was supported by the National Natural Science Foundation of China and Peking University People's Hospital Research and Development Funds. Last but not least, I owe my heartfelt thanks to all those participated in and offered cordial support to this study. That's all. Thank you. Hello, Jiren. Thank you very much for joining us virtually from China. Um, just to begin with, while well, questions start to stream in, the first question, um, did you find any of the um, BLAOXA23 gene um, in the chromosomes? Could you remind me again of that finding? You talked about this gene being on the plasmids, but was it um, in the chromosomes, in the bacterial isolates that you were examining as well? Yes, we also examined the uh, BLA or XA23 genes in the chromosome and find that um, they were all uh, carried by the transposons and um, the, they are the same type with the plasma. Right, okay. Um, you, you talked about um, the, these resistance genes conferring some fitness. Um, are there any other resistant genes that you know which may confer fitness uh, to the bacteria that you're studying? Apart from OXA23. Yeah, there are also uh, resistant other resistant genes in the chromosome, um, like um, BLA, uh, ABC, or other uh, TET B genes, but there is not uh, no other resistant genes in plasmid. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, we also investigate the virulence uh, related genes in the chromosome and plasma uh, in the chromosome and we didn't find any discrepancies between uh, the coexisted isolates and the single located one so uh, maybe uh, uh, further investigation of the uh, mechanism uh, of the fitness changing uh, are needed right um, and final question um, from the audience were the isolates grown in the presence of carbapenems, and what were the difference in growth rates? Um, we have we haven't done this uh, the growth as a uh, growth curve as in the carbapenem, so maybe we will do it uh, in our future study. Yeah. And Dr. Allen, do you have any more questions for Jiren? I do. Um... Why, what, what, do you, what is the proposed me mechanism of while there are multiple copies of um, uh, the gene, uh, the resistance gene, uh, what's the theory that uh, it, even though it doesn't increase the MIC, but it does increase the fitness? Why is that? Um, uh, it, was, uh, it has been uh, reported that um, resistant genes, uh, the, the mm -hmm. Um, uh, it has been reported that um, the acquire of the, the the acquire of the resistant genes um, might have some relationship with the fitness uh, fitness changing, and it might bring the fitness cost. So, um, uh, it it is believed that the more resistant genes um, the isolates uh, got from uh, horizontal transfer or other way, they uh, the fitness of these isolates might be uh, increasing. Thank you very much. Um, we hope to yeah. see um, the presenters in person at the next conference and not virtually. Um, stay safe and have okay. a good day. Thank, Thank you. Thank very good. Our next uh, speaker and our final speaker is uh, zooming in or platforming in from uh, India. Uh, it is uh, Ms. Ruchi uh, Supakar, uh, who will be speaking to us about uh, the detection of hepatitis B virus um, in uh, lower denomination paper currencies in a, de a, dis a densely populated uh, Indian city. Um, Ms. Supakar, over to you and welcome. Good evening, everyone. I am Ruchi Supakar, currently pursuing my PhD in occult hepatitis B virus infection from CSIR Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, Kolkata, India, under the guidance of Dr. Subhajit Bishwa. Before beginning, I would like to thank the organizers and the sponsors of this conference for providing me with an opportunity to present my paper at this conference. The title of my today's presentation is Hepatitis B virus detected in lower denomination paper currencies in a densely populated Indian city. 
But before moving forward, let's uh, look at the background of the study. Now, the recent rise in the incidences of hepatitis B virus infection in a densely populated city of Eastern India prom prompted the search. Now, the paper currencies are widely used as a mode of transaction, irrespective of socioeconomic and immune statuses of the individual. So, the chances of microbial contamination, especially in the currencies of the lower denomination, are higher as they are more in exchange. So, the common practice of enumerating the currency notes using saliva in Indian subcontinent is very common. But not only here, also it is common in various other parts of the world as well. So, the potential source of horizontal transmission of HBV, especially if there are cuts and bruises on the oral mucous membrane or skin, is, uh, can be the paper currencies. So the main aim of the study was to investigate whether the paper currencies can serve as a plausible mode of horizontal transmission of HBV infection in areas of high population density. So for this, the various methods were adopted. Initially, sample collection was done. 70 paper uh, currency notes were collected of the INR10, which is the lower Indian currency denomination, from various hospitals, grocery stores, fish meat markets, public transports, and various such other public places. And the time duration was 2016 to 17 for the sample collection. Now, the surfaces of each sample were thoroughly washed with 5 ml of 1x PBS and, and was subjected to ultra centrifugation at 64,000 G for 90 minutes at 4 degrees Celsius. And the precipitate which was formed was collected at the bottom of the centrifuge tube, washed thoroughly, and was suspended in 0.5 ml of 1x PBS. And the ultra centrifuge sample was collected in a fresh tube. Now, this ultra centrifuge sample was subjected to DNA extraction, after which it was subjected to polymerase chain reaction, where the S gene amplification was done and was visualized on agrose gel electrophoresis. Also, for the confirmation of the PCR products, nucleotide sequencing was done of the S gene in order to confirm the S gene sequence. Also, HBS AG ELISA was done to um, check whether the HBV particles were present or not. Now, also to gather the visual evidences, initially the immunoprecipitation was done in order to trap the HBV particles using the antibody against the S, S, and S antigen. And then this immunoprecipitated sample was subjected to atomic force microscopy to see the HBV virion particles. The results found was that the 7.14% uh, of the samples, that is 5 out of 70, were found to be contaminated with potentially intact or viable HBV of genotype D2. Then hepatitis uh, B surface antigen ELISA results were all negative for all the five samples. So we can conclude that the molecular analysis and the enzyme Im immunoassays suggested that the circular HBV may be occult in nature. That is ELISA negative but DNA positive. The image shown here is of the, is at 1.2 kb band which is visible for the HBV S gene for all the five samples here. Then the HBV S protein sequences which is a 226 amino acid long multiple sequence alignment uh, furnished various uh, mutations like S34L, I81T and a trio of P118V, A128V and P127T along with M133I mutation, which is a well-known mutation, was also identified. And all these on, uh, mutations, they contributed to impaired immunological detection. That's why we could uh, relate that all the ELISA results were negative, because maybe because of these mutations. Now, the atomic force microscopy results shown uh, a cluster of virion particles for the positive sample. Now here is the uh, cluster of virion particle of the HBV. The arrow is pointing towards one of them. and uh, But still we were not sure whether this is HBV particle only or not because, uh, it didn't, because the uh, morphology was not visible here clearly. So in order to uh, segregate these particles, so what we have done was we uh, performed a tritonix treatment upon this immunoprecipitated samples and which so our post uh, tritonic treatment now the virion for the virion particles the outer envelope uh, was disrupted with the tritonic treatment and what we could see here is the exposure of the icosahedral capsid of the virion, virion particle now the arrows are pointing towards the icosahedral uh, particle so these and also these the size if we see on the scale the size of these particles are in accordance with the hbv uh, size that is of 42 nanometers. So here we could confirm that these were the HBV particles only. Then also similar treatment was done for the negative samples as well. Initially, the immunoprecipitated negative sample furnished such kind of globular structures which were of the regular pattern but they resembled nothing like of HBV. 
uh, also then tritonic treatment was done for that so what we could see here was a clear field of view where no hbv particles like the icosahedral one which was uh, seen for the positive samples were visible so with this we could conclude that applying saliva on the fingers for counting the bank notes is a common practice in the indian subcontinent and many other countries of the world and should be strictly avoided and the paper uh, notes may be the source of horizontal trans transmission of hbv as well as other environmentally stable infectious viruses like sars cov2 which emerged recently the detection of the potentially intact or viable and occult hbv on currency notes and in considerable manner for this potential risk of silent transmission of this virus in densely populated cities like calcutta now at last i would like to acknowledge 18th asia pacific congress of clinical microbiology and infection singapore 2021 for providing me with this opportunity and also academy of scientific and innovative research gaziabad india and council of scientific and industrial research indian institute of chemical biology kolkata india for providing with all the financial and infrastructural assistance for carrying out the study and also council of scientific and industrial research senior research fellowship for providing with the personal financial assistances and also at last i would like to thank dr shubhadi vishwas who is a principal scientist at infectious diseases and immunology division csr icb kolkata and is also my tc supervisor thank you for your attention now we open for the questions thank you ms supercar that was a lovely presentation uh, thank you so much uh, and welcome um, I'm interested, thank you, thank you. you collected uh, currency from a number of locations, and then that's all that we heard, uh, and that you did identify, obviously, uh, hepatitis B virus DNA. Could, it was, were the detection in all of those locations, or were there particular places, markets, banks, or, or what have you? Did, did you find that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, we have collected it from different locations. Basically, the uh, means point before collection was that uh, we have to see multiple locations where more of the lower denomination currency was exchanged. So, uh, like public places and the uh, public transports, uh, grocery shops, and all. So, we have actually targeted those places, and uh, then we have uh, like. Different different places. When we have uh, screened the currency samples, we have found that more of the public transport uh, was rampant in uh, detection. Means we have found more on for the public transport than okay. rather than uh, any other location. Okay, and you mentioned that one of the reasons why you may have had uh, a negative elisis for your hepatitis B surface antigen was because of the mutations uh, that were present. Have those mutations been associated with uh, a negative elisa assay, or, or is that uh, speculation? Have you pursued that further? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, we, ha we are studying those mutations. Once we have detected those mutations, so transfection studies are going on. We have uh, means... Uh, Induced those mutations through site-directed mutagenesis on the uh, plasmid wild-type plasmid backbone, and uh, we are uh, analyzing those mutations. And yes, uh, we are seeing that they are occult in nature. Hmm. So that data is not presented in this paper, but uh, yeah, it is in a, it is conducted in a separate study. Thank you for that interesting talk. Just one final question from me: How do you prove that the um, Hepatitis B material um, that you picked up um, were were possibly um, alive or transmissible, um, and how are you going to prove it? Uh, yeah, that is a challenge actually because human to human transition we cannot show because uh, that is not uh, possible for us to show. Uh, so uh, we have actually the ongoing study on this is going on. Uh, for we are trying to infect the HUF seven cells and seeing the implication of these. Uh, this virus which we have detected and uh, yeah so sir, the mam studies are going on right now. that would be interesting um and and since you mentioned about hepatitis b did you ever also um find anything about hepatitis um c or an increase in hepatitis c infections in the population through such transmissions uh, not not yet ma'am but uh, just now our focus area was hepatitis b only but yeah that is an interesting thing to carry out in future and we'll definitely think about that uh, thank you thank you for being here with us on this virtual platform all the way thank from you. india thank you so much yeah um, thank you thank you we'd like to thank all the participants and all the um, presenters who have joined us virtually um, at this conference 
So thank you for joining us on day two APCCMI and see you tomorrow on the other sessions. Thank you. Have a good evening.